Hi everyone, I'm Rupika. I'm another PhD student here at WMG. So my background is in microbiology and biomedical science, but in my PhD I'm also looking at uh, material sciences and how we can apply antimicrobials into coatings. So since obviously COVID-19, the global value for antimicrobial properties has increased massively. So in 2019, it was worth 2.6 billion, rising to 3.5 billion in 2020, and it's forecasted by the end of 2030, it will be worth approximately 6.8 billion pounds. Now, obviously that also comes with a problem in itself. The problem is that there's a greater risk, a greater need to clean surfaces, to basically keep happier environments as well and protect from microbes. So it's estimated in a year around about 4 million people will acquire a healthcare associated infection. Now that's not just in a hospital, that could be in a care home or even an individual's home that has long-term care requirements. And sadly, among those 4 million people, around about 37,000 deaths will occur. Now some of those deaths could actually be prevented by small changes. And combating these infections is a significant problem within the healthcare sector globally. So it's important to note that disinfectants can't be used everywhere. And that's the same with hand sanitizer as well. But it's not only that, is how many of you put hand sanitizer on and then go touch something whilst your hands are still wet? Because I know I've done it a few times and I see plenty of other people do it. Yeah, there you go. See, the thing with hand sanitizer, it's only effective once it's dried. And the same with disinfectants as well, is that they're not always used correctly. So how can we combat all those issues? Well, surface coatings already exist. And like from Natalie's talk, you have steel, you would have noticed that from some of the pictures that there was different colors. So a way to protect from things like corrosion is we apply a coating from it. It's a protective barrier. This one is just has a different application. Now there's obviously different applications for surface coatings. It could be aesthetic. For example, this wall, it's not this color all the way through, just on the outside. So same logic applies with antimicrobial coatings. If you don't have a coating on the surface, bacteria can thrive and stay on there and can be transmitted to the next person. However, with the coating, it can reduce the amount of bacteria present. So it's a cost effective way of handling antimicrobial or handling rather the problem. So for example, during COVID, one of the things that people realized from small studies is that petrol pumps are actually a big way of transmitting, well, all diseases, not just COVID. So a lot of petrol pumps now, if the, for those of you that drive, um, will notice they're actually now covered with an antimicrobial coating because it's one of the few times where you may not have hand sanitizer or washing facilities readily available, but you will use your whole hand to f and full contact with filling up your car. So what else is also coated with antimicrobial properties? For example, food products. How many of you have ever thought about the cartons that you pick up, for example, uh, whether they're protective against what's inside and versus what you touch it with? Quite a lot of products are covered with an antimicrobial coating, and that could be to protect the food from the inside, but also protect the outside of the container as well. And obviously, if you ever had to have a medical implant, you kind of hope that it was resistant to uh, bacteria sitting on it. So we have all seen antimicrobial liquids such as hand sanitizers and disinfectants, but why would we then use antimicrobial coatings? Well, I mean, if you're like me, how many of you have decided when you're cleaning a surface, you kind of just go like a bit of an S shape and you just think, yeah, it's all clean. I'm pretty sure probably a lot of us do it and not even realize it, but obviously not the whole surface is cleaned. So by having a coating, it's all covered. So if you do disinfect it with something else on top, for the most part, the coating's already done most of the job. But not only that is they're more environmentally friendly and they're more cost effective. So you don't have to worry about any toxic exposure from like inhalation or over time, if you have repeated exposure to hand sanitizer, your skin might crack, for example. So all antimicrobial coatings or even coatings in general are a change in a material surface. So depending on what your substrate is, you can apply the coating on top, but they can either be a chemical modification or a physical modification. So chemical, for exa example, is silicon dioxide and titanium dioxide. Titanium dioxide you, is commonly known for what gives paint and pigments its white color. 
and it's also used in light activated antimicrobial surfaces so where you can use something like a UV light to create um, that antimicrobial effect. You can also have physical um, modifications where we change the surface. For example, think of it as like a nail file. If you obviously rub your nail on it, it blunts down your nail. But if you do the same thing and have a microabrasive surface um, for an antimicrobial purpose, the bacteria will basically be spliced on coming on. So if we look into chemical modifications a little bit more, so the most common ones, I'm pretty sure you all would have heard of copper coatings and nanoparticles. Can anyone give me a um, nanoparticle coating that they would have heard of or a metal in one? Copper can also be put into as a nanoparticle as well as it being itself. Now these are just small, small particles that sit there in like almost like a web and have antimicrobial properties. But both silver and copper have been known for their antimicrobial properties for quite a number of years. So does anyone here drive? So are you quite into your cars, would you say? Okay, so you may have heard of graphene coatings then. So graphene oxide is typically what is used on cars to basically provide a hydrophobic surface. So obviously if anyone that drives or even see cars, you might see like water droplets or even the same as if you see water droplets in a bathroom mirror. You basically, people don't want that on their cars. So they use graphene coatings or graphene oxide specifically to protect their cars from like UV rays, dirt, and the water very literally just runs off the surface. Now, if we apply the same logic to putting it as an antimicrobial coating, any bacterial droplets, so say for example, if someone sneeze on, sneezes on the surface, the droplets more or less just kind of run off and effectively. Now with polymer coatings, that's another chemical modification, but they're probably the most versatile. You can have a wide range of applications for that and uses, and they can be tailored in many different ways. You can also attach other molecules on top of polymer coatings as well. So back to earlier when we said about physical modifications, like if you think of surface rough roughness as kind of like a nail file application and like your nail being like the bacteria, it'll basically just slice it and wear it down and the bacteria can't sit there in one piece and be able to transfer to somebody else. But another example is a material alteration. So for example, if we have something like a plasma spray coating, that's where we basically use heat to soften like a powdered particle and then apply it on top. Now that physical alteration on top allows that material to then have antimicrobial properties depending on the powder that you started with. After all these modifications, how do they all, how do all these coatings work? So if we link it back to earlier, obviously there's different types of mechanisms. So if you remember from the graphene coating, for example, the water kind of will just run off. That's for example, like a hydrophobic coating. You can have polymer coatings, for example, to be both biocide releasing and contact active. Similar sort of thing with nanoparticles. So a nanoparticle will be a contact active. It doesn't release anything, but upon contact, the bacteria can't survive. A, bi a biocide releasing one could release something like, for example, penicillin, or it could release another sort of biocide that basically kills the bacteria. Similar idea to how antibiotics would work in the body. Electrostatic repulsion, now the best way, like from the image there, is just to think if you had two magnets and you put the same two polar ends with each other, they will repel each other no matter how hard you push. That's the same thing with electrostatic repulsion. And then you have steric repulsion, which is where you have polymers attached to a surface and they're providing a physical barrier in which bacteria cannot go onto. And obviously all of these are far better than just having no coating at all because the bacteria, viruses, whatever it's protecting against can easily sit onto that. So how do we determine how efficient an antimicrobial coating is? This is kind of where I come in. Now this is my favorite, more favorite part, is all the microbiological testing. Now there's several standards that industry use to determine how effective a coating is. But it's also important to note that Actually, there isn't just one single set of tests either. Industries can kind of pick and choose as to what standard they would like to carry out. But the main focus is, obviously the main point is, that you want to have a surface that doesn't do this. Imagine this is non-coated bacteria before and after the test and the viruses before and after the test still thrive. If you had something like the blue coated image, then you could say that's antiviral because the viruses, which are in red, 
don't survive after the testing procedure, but the bacteria do. Now, yes, that's still beneficial, but if, for example, it's in a setting where actually there's a lot of bacterial infections, probably not going to be doing the best. And the same with yellow coating, this will be antibacterial. Now, the goal is obviously when you do your tests, you want something like the orange one, where both the bacteria and the virus don't survive. Now, obviously, it's great determining how efficient it is against bacteria, but how is it going to weather in the real life? Well, obviously, if I just stuck a coating on the side here, great, it's a flat surface. But if I try and put it on the uh, rail, for example, that's a round surface. So how do I know that when I bend that material in shape, it won't crack? Because if it does, it could just leave the bacteria to hide it in the crack as opposed to actually being killed. So that's where material science comes in. You can conduct a series of tests and use different machinery, such as like a nano indent to determine how hard a surface is, or even a physical testing such as like microscopy to just determine how a surface will look. Obviously one of the main things was you, you want to make sure that the coating just doesn't like slide off because the last thing you want is to be able to go along and rip a coating straight off. It's not going to do its job, especially if you put it somewhere where kids are, they like picking at things and they will rip it straight off. So obviously with all of these testing combined with the microbiology testing that provides a real life picture on how coatings will react in the real life. If we go back to the original picture in the start of the presentation, that'll help reduce those 37,000 deaths. Won't necessarily like stop it completely because obviously again there's a lot of factors involved with that but it will certainly make a difference. And yeah, thank you.